have many new drugs for diabetes and we have the old drugs. My adage is take new drugs but keep the old. So the old drugs are metformin and sulfonylureas, which are very inexpensive, very good at controlling blood glucose, but the sulfonylureas can cause weight gain. And so we have a different class of drug that is similar to them called the DPP-4s, and they're a little more expensive, kind of do the same thing. We have one more class of drug called pioglitazone that may be associated with some weight gain, but it's very good for people who also have fatty liver disease. And then we have insulin, and insulin will work. It can cause hypoglycemia, can cause weight gain, but it will lower the sugar if delivered appropriately. If you think of the way that insulin is secreted in the body, you always have some insulin on board, so you never have zero insulin, even when you're not eating. And then when you have a meal, you have a spike. And so the question then is, you know, when you were manufacturing insulin, could you do something that could affect the, how long it lasted in the body. And so the next innovation was to actually alter the half-life. We now have rapid acting insulins. We have insulins that you can give yourself a shot literally the, the minute you, you take your meal because it's going to be absorbed really fast. But we also have long-acting insulin that one shot will last a day or even longer. Our understanding has allowed us to really have different versions of insulin that really becomes important. Ultimately, the approach is going to be personalized. For most patients, the approach is starting with metformin, which I think most would agree is an important background um, medication. They, they, the nice thing about metformin is that it is actually quite safe and it doesn't cause hypoglycemia and maybe somewhat weight neutral. But you may have to add other agents. A long time ago, you'd come in, you get one drug, then you'd go away, then you'd fail, then add another, and so forth. The mindset now is really in relatively short time intervals, I'm talking in the three to six month time interval, look at the efficacy of whatever we do with a view to intensifying therapy. The other part of the early evaluation is to what extent is this being driven by obesity? At a population level, I don't think anybody would argue with the notion that a big driver of this insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome, in fact, is obesity. Having said that, not everybody who presents with type 2 diabetes is necessarily obese. So you have, it's a spectrum. You have some individuals who may have a, a bigger beta cell defect and less insulin resistance, whereas some people may have a lot of insulin resistance and maybe a lesser beta cell um, defect. All of those things together will then be weighed by the medical provider in terms of what initial um, therapies might be offered. Now we have some newer medications, high-dose GLP-1 agents or combined agents of GLP-1, GIP, that can give us significant weight loss. GLP-1 reduces appetite. Therefore, to the extent to which obesity is also a driver of insulin resistance, not only are you sort of bringing down the blood sugar, but you're also having individuals lose weight. And, and as a consequence of that, you're getting a, an additional benefit um, of, of, of the agent. That class of drug also is cardioprotective. Most guidelines would now say that if you have somebody with diabetes who's at high risk for cardiovascular disease, GLP-1 receptor agonists may be an early choice. These drugs are injectable drugs that are more potent. Starting this new class of agents is something that has to be progressive and gradual to be successfully well tolerated. Another new drug are the SGLT2 inhibitors. These drugs have a property of a little bit of weight loss, but they are cardioprotective and heart failure protective and kidney protective. If you can imagine what the kidney is, it's like a filter. And so it filters your blood, it makes urine. So you have all these transporters in the kidney that actually reabsorbs things that you need. One of the things that the SGLT2 does, it reabsorbs sodium and it reabsorbs glucose. 
There are inhibitors of this called SGLT2 inhibitors. And basically what they do is that they make you pee more glucose out. Some people will have increased yeast or fungal infections. SGLT2 inhibitors can also cause something called ketoacidosis. These are rare events, but certainly events that people should be aware of. If you meet a patient who is otherwise uncomplicated, if weight is a real issue, you're going to use a drug that does not cause weight gain and may facilitate weight loss. If you really need big glucose lowering, then you're going to take the drugs that are more potent or use insulin. In contrast, if you meet a person who already has kidney complications, heart failure complications, or coronary artery disease, or stroke, or amputation from peripheral artery disease, you go immediately to the, either the SGLT2 inhibitors or the GLP-1 receptor agonists. Many of us who advocate for patients with diabetes think this is a very important move, and it's still not perfect. One of the important barriers that our clients face accessing healthcare is really health insurance. 40% of our clients stopped buying medication because of they didn't have money for it. It's a huge barrier. In the ideal world, where cost was not an issue, you'd be having conversations about SGLT2 inhibitors or GLP-1 receptor agonists. The reality is those two new classes of agents are incredibly expensive. We're talking a 50-fold difference in price. There are second-generation sulfonylureas that are faster acting, less prone to lead to hypoglycemia, and therefore, for some individuals, that as second-line therapy, if they, they still remain hyperglycemic while on metformin, remains appropriate, recognizing that, you know, you have to really work with and counsel the patients about the risk of um, hyperglycemia. The pharmacy where I work has a $5 list of medications. So if it's an expensive medication, I'll check and see if it's at our pharmacy for the $5 list. If it's a brand new medicine that's out with no generics, a lot of times they'll have special programs for people that are lower income that they can get it free. I'll see if we can sign up for one of those. There are lots of ways to get people their medications that just take a little extra time. Everyone's walk to wellness is different. There are so many environmental factors that impact that journey. Many people have lots of boulders on that pathway. Sometimes they're able to move that out the way and all they see now is that there are 24 more ahead of them. It's our job as physicians and as a healthcare system to remove those obstacles that are in the way for patients as they are marching on their way to wellness.